Help Me Be Me is self-help for people who hate self-help, hosted by me, Sarah May. What I talk about on this show is my personal opinion, and it's not a substitute for professional help. I'm not a licensed therapist, and this is based on the tools I use in my own life. Take what helps and leave the rest. If you're really suffering, call 911 or your local emergency services. Hi friends, it's Sarah May, and this is an episode called Words, our past experiences, the stories we tell, and basically why words matter. So a disclaimer before I go into this episode, I want you to temper this if you are in a place where you're unable to reach out to people, and I don't want you to use this episode to not reach out if you're basically mentally in a bad place. So use this only if you are in a place of health and functioning. Having been in a place when I was personally not functioning, I get that advice can be taken at the wrong time and it can be uh, not good advice for wherever you're at. So if you are struggling alone right now, I would say don't listen to this and use it as a reason to be more alone. This episode is really targeted at helping you to recognize your own words and make them conscious and guided because they very much narrate the future of your life. So the ones you use inside and also importantly outside really do tell you and others how things will go. Also, the stories we tell ourselves are often not even our own. We inherit them from parents or others who have modeled a situation for us in our formative years. And so you might find yourself repeating things and really feeling them and acting them out, even though they're not related to your life and your history. So this is an episode really focused around being more aware and also deliberate in your words. So curating a more positive and and empowering story for yourself and for those who live and play with you in your life. So with that, here is part one, the what. Our words, the stories we tell on repeat, the things we report to others that we haven't seen in a while, um, the things that we complain about when someone asks us how we feel, the narratives we spill about ourselves, who we are, where we are in our lives, what's wrong with our lives, what we plan to do, or what we're working toward. The slogans or summary statements we give to people when we see them on a casual basis, or the scripts that we say when we're hurt or feel ignored or unloved. The things we say when we're unhappy in our relationships or when we're feeling down. The things we say when we start to vent to a friend. All the things we say really about us and life and what life currently is and where it's going. These things we say, many of them are unconscious, and many of them are also pre-programmed. Often we don't realize it, but there are so many unique sides to words and phrases. Many of them mean such different things to people, including the people we think we know inside and out. So the same sentence you think you're saying out of love, with the goal to make someone feel seen, or the goal of delivering one tiny, very specific nugget of context, might to them feel like a continuation of a fight. Or familiarity expressed to one person might in their mind show up like you are disrespecting them. So I bring this latter point up just to keep you standing back from the words you use and giving them enough distance and openness to examine them more objectively, both when you say them and also when you witness others hearing them. They are not what we think they are at all times. Which brings me to part two, the why. Our formative experiences and also the formative experiences that left a mark, you know, the ones that manifest as fears and insecurities, the beliefs that color how we view ourselves, are the translator to the words, actions, and meanings we take in of others. However, when we approach everyone, including ourselves, from a place of non-judgment and listening with no attachment to a feeling, we can more often see that the truth minus our coloring, the coloring that comes from the negative or insecure feeling. 
And we can have a reaction to the words and like be in them as if we're on a drug that is created by that word. And then we can step back from that and really look at it from the opposite side. And that also goes for others. Like words can evoke old and distant felt experiences that then color a new experience. Um, Stuff like, I'm not happy. That could mean a whole new chapter is just all of a sudden brought into someone's brain that means this relationship's ending, this is dire, like all of a sudden they're on the drug that is that feeling and they can't even see you or hear you anymore. So the words we use around issues matter. They matter hugely, but also so much gets lost in translation just based on what words mean to us based on our emotional heritage. So when we talk about things with others, they experience our words with the baggage or charge of what they meant to them growing up or based on a past or recent experience. So I just want you to think of this importance also when it comes to the words you use and the stories you tell to yourself, because there's also the reverse effect of words. They can conjure old feelings and existing feelings, but they also create the future path of feelings. Like they create the future of the, the, the path you're going to live. It's like our bodies are like little submarines and we say, alter path for Northwest 20 knots. And then our bodies do just that. We listen to where this story is charted for and follow directions. So the stories we tell And the things we say aloud to others become more true than we think. And a lot of the time, we're not really paying attention to the weight of the literal things we are saying. Like, we're not even examining them from other people's perspectives. Just Often we get into grooves of autopilot where we can really just stop listening to ourselves. Like, just like we cannot really hear our own voices minus the base of our own skulls. Like, you know that thing when you hear yourself recorded and usually it sounds more nasal? Same goes for just the things we typically say. We don't really understand often the volume of them, the meaning of them, the tinge of them, because it's just something we've said for so long. So my main point I'm trying to make is we... We need to watch the story we tell because in many ways we are on autopilot and also we are telling ourselves an outlook. You are telling yourself how things are going to be, how they're going to go. And you are also telling those you love how things are going to be, how they're going to go. Even even if we're telling a story we believe to be untrue, like even if we are deliberately misleading someone or let's say we're trying to tell a story to make ourselves seem better or more polished in the eyes of somebody else and we know that that thing is not true, the, those stories are become more true than we realize. So they, they're always pointing to something that our brain has inside of it. We just don't realize it. Like a lot of our words are like mini maps to things about us. So it's really important to listen to you consciously. Um, and see exactly what it is you are saying. See exactly what it is you say when you're mad, when you're sad and clingy, or when you're putting on a big grown-up voice like you're trying to impress. What we're looking for here is room to bring out more kindness, honesty, and peacemaking, and positivity. And I don't mean like, I want you to tell people things you don't like about them. I, I think there's a, a version of honesty that is in inherently optimistic that we we can choose a real story that is true that is also a positive one and massive changes can be made in things like loops of negative behaviors Um, they can be undone when we get out of what is often an unconscious attack mode and instead become clear in a goal to just simply come from love or lean toward the slightly more optimistic outcome And I don't mean in like a manipulative sense. I mean in a, I am coming from love. I'm coming from love. Also, I'm coming from love sense. Because when it comes to relationships, if we can ignore the barbs and, and not engage the battle, the battle words, the prompts to, to rejoin battle, we create 
new responses. We create new interactions. And we also feel more aligned with our truest selves. So in some ways, I'm asking you to side with the lighter, kinder, more loving side of yourself that exists at all times, even when you feel low, crabby, and at your worst. And according to research, speaking the kind words, even when you don't feel kind, makes this self more likely to dominate. So there might be a misalignment for good or for bad between what we say and what we feel inside. However, if, we ha- if we're divided, you know, we will be more inclined to side with the voice we hear. I hear somebody calling my name right now. A tiny, tiny person. I'll be right back. When we hear ourselves say something that is tied more into the positive, more aspirational, if we are ambivalent, we are more likely to see that thing as possible just by hearing ourselves say it. Additionally, I want you to scan the words you use for phrases that are familiar to you, like things that you might have heard in your family of origin. For example, things that a parent or a caregiver caregiver might have said, or things that someone told you about yourself when you were young. We practice ways of being by practicing ways of thinking, and that includes verbal direction we give ourselves. I often ask clients when they bring up doubts or fears or excuses, whose words are those? Are they yours? And because as we get older, we start to act out some of the belief systems that we understood growing up especially around scarcity or lack, or about what we can expect from others or from relationships or what the worst can be, these become lodged in our identity, especially when it comes to traditional family roles. We learned that default system just like we learned about princesses and evil stepmothers. So you might find yourself acting out a role of your mother if you are a mother or If you are a hetero woman, you might find yourself assuming partners will be like your father, or you might feel like a pervert wearing makeup if you are a man, because every single film portrayal you've seen shows the seedy, sketchy character is the man wearing makeup. So these ideas implanted can be varied. It could also show up as a way that you talk about money and wealth, like you might take on the resent you had for those with wealth if you grew up in a situation of poverty and you are exposed to uh, extreme disparity. So the reason to become aware of these scripts is because sometimes they are not helping us today or they're not even relevant to us today and they're not true for us anymore, but they can sneak into our mouths and we start saying them again. We start practicing them again. And this is when we are unconsciously acting out old beliefs or somebody else's beliefs. We don't have to do that. We can look at them and adopt new, healthier, more inspiring scripts. We get to write the words we say. We get to identify healthier people around us and see what is their attitude toward money. What is their belief around relationships? What is their expectation of others and how they talk about themselves and how they show up as themselves, how they respond to others? Are they worth their words? And we can then adopt those practices as our own. We can be, quote, raised by them and act as them and then practice to becomes us. It just becomes a part of who you are. The more you practice something, it becomes you. It continue, this other person, whoever we are modeling, can continue to grow us by simply showing us how to act, how to love, how to be kind with our words, how to be accountable as humans, how to earn trust, how to demonstrate power, self-respect, and embody importance. These are all things you can learn and lean into simply by amplifying the right thoughts over the less helpful ones and betting on the positive. Even if we don't believe them yet, they get more true with use. Which brings me to part three, the how, the tools. So these tools are really for filtering your awareness, like learning to see what it is that is stuck to your goggles, meaning comparisons, etc. And the, the goal here is also to amplify the change, like amplify the shift toward the possible and the positive. 
So all different types of tools. Some of them are um, more based in you. Some of them are make more based in others. Hopefully something in here will help you. First one is called, or the first one is a journal reflection. So grab a journal. It's uh, the exercise is noting our stories. So I want you to just jot down the stories you have that repeat anything that you might want to alter toward a more positive bend in your life. So for example, if it's to do with a relationship, let's say the prompt would be, what is the story you tell your partner most often about your relationship when you are fighting or when you are in a place of clinginess or negativity? Like what is the negative story that tends to come up and repeat? The second half of this prompt is, where could this be from or whose story is this? Does this relate to somebody else in your family of origin? Another prompt for related to you and yourself. What is the negative story you tend to tell yourself about you? Is it that XYZ bad thing happens again and again? What is the story you tell when you feel stuck? What is the story you tell yourself about your path? Like, for example, you are mid-change, if that you are confident about the future, that change is possible. Whatever it is, I want you to become of aware of any story that might be less than empowering and figure out the shift that might want to happen in just the way you describe that story. All right, the next tool... Always bet on yay. Uh, You know how they have those roulette rules, always bet on black. I have no idea because I don't gamble, but um, this tool is always bank on the positive. Just always lean that way. Assume the best. Speak the best of yourself. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Give others the benefit of the doubt and literally say, maybe they had a good reason to do it. And I want you to think about me the first time you you use this tool because I will bet you a high five that that positive thing you bet on comes true so just take note so I mean like for example I don't know someone flakes someone doesn't show up or someone is in is in a really grouchy mood whatever it is I just want you to lean on the positive say like maybe maybe they have a really good reason to feel that way and I'm just not aware of it Maybe this is for a completely good reason that they're not showing up. Just try that out. Just see what happens. Bet on the yay. All right, the next tool. Which story are you choosing? So two opposite stories exist always simultaneously on all about everything. There's a positive interpretation of something negative always. So I want you to just mentally use this as a calculation tool. Those who are optimists, and happy for the most part, their brain defaults to the positive story. And both things are true, but one will make you feel good and the other will make you feel bad. So when you feel good, your life overwhelmingly feels positive, possible, open, optimistic, etc. So it's it's a no-brainer here what we want to have happen. So, I, But I think the best way to use this tool, if you're starting to use it for the first time, is just to notice when you give a negative explanation of something and then see it and manually flip it. Like to deduce that there's also an equally true positive version of the exact same fact. Case in point, for recently my husband was lamenting something about our garage and my brain said, This here, this thing that sucks is here to activate a more rapid change to occur, which it did. I cleaned the shit out of the garage, (laughs) but that was activated because of the negative thing. Um, All of those are true things. Both things are true, but my brain's like, oh, this is a gift of some awesome change happening. And the more you can practice this tendency, the more it just automatically happens all the time. The next tool, map of flowers. This is another tool from the great Clarissa Pinkola Estes. I just learned that that's how you say her name. So my bad on the last time I referenced her. Um, But to take basically a spread in your journal and draw a map of your mini 
deaths in life. And by that, I mean like kind of like the flowers by the side of the road. These are the things, the times when something hurt you, something thwarted you, something changed you in your life story. And the reason to do this exercise is to notice what mud you might be have on your filter currently. And just for you to be able to see it as old and see it as past. Often with children, um, when they experience something that's traumatizing or upsetting or makes them feel powerless or overwhelmed, because they don't have the capacity to record a narrative memory yet, like we can't, they can't recall that thing in time, we have to help them put that experience in context by narrating it for them so that they can release it and make peace with it. Like it can be something totally random. Like if someone was say trying to force a kid to go into a pool and they really didn't want to go in the pool, they might have this really upsetting feeling associated with pools moving forward, but they won't understand why. So when you can help them tell that story to themselves, I can say like, yeah, that was scary. You didn't want to go. And and then we helped you and you got in and you were okay. You remember that? It's It gives them context in order to let it go. And funnily enough, the same goes for adults. A lot of the time, if we moved past something without processing it, um, it can just leave a, an emotional residue. And it can kind of f- sit with us in a weird way where we're acting on it, but we don't understand why we're acting on it. So the goal here with this exercise is not to dwell or relive something that caused you trauma. In fact, if you think this is going to buck you up and make you feel overwhelmed, don't do it. This is really, if you are in a stable place to help you to mourn those selves and validate those experiences in a context that is healthier and more capable. And to see that whoever that self was that got thwarted is still part of you. All the people who made up who we are on our path, this is the the path we have walked, the choices that we had to make, all all of that is, it, it can be tragic and we can cry about it, but the origin, the ingredients still make up your sum, like your spirit and that energy is still intact. So this is a, an exercise as a way to make our story cohesive and also integrate to put the past in the past, be able to see things that are popping up currently, see where maybe we have motivations that are confusing to us, to start to trace them and say like, oh, that makes sense why I would have that fear or that makes sense why I wouldn't want to try and push myself into blank. So it allows us this map to put down things that aren't serving us, perhaps grieve, perhaps vent anger over past junctures, but do it safely and consciously. For example, in therapy, the ultimate goal here is that you can become more aware of when things from the past are unnecessarily coloring the behavior and the words of the present and just put them in perspective. Like, oh, this, this reaction is coming from this, this death. That's what, that's what that's coming from. This power comes from this pain here. It doesn't have to be the, it doesn't have to control where I am today. It doesn't have to create the meaning of where I am today. All right. The next tool is called verbal flare. I want you to adopt, I don't know if you know what flare is. Um, you need to watch office space to learn, but it's those little pins you put on uh, lapels or on jackets and backpacks. Um, so I want you to adopt some new verbal flare, some new phrases that are aspirational, but claim that whatever aspiration in the present, because what you practice, you become, this is truth. So for example, saying our family is very close, that makes it more true. Or we are a family who loves dogs. That makes it more true to you also. So right now I will ask you, what is one phrase you are going to plant in your brain that you will bring up in the near future and speak as truth? I'm going to do it too. My mind will be, our family summer is packed with laughter and dancing. Our family summer is packed with, yeah, I like that one. All right, next tool, whose words are these? I think I already over, I covered this one, but I just want you to keep top of mind. It's important to pay attention to the words you're using, uh, especially when they do not belong to you. Like specifically in moments that you bring up a worry or a fear, just look at them for a second and ask, 
mentally, could these could these words belong to somebody else? Could these belong to my parent? Could these belong to fill in the blank person that made an impact on me? Just try it on for size. Next tool is called, what am I asking them to do? So this is a filter for communication, for kind communication. Usually what we are asking of someone in the exchange that is um, saying anything negative or passing on any complaint, anything that we're experiencing that is not a good thing, what, what we do with any communication with somebody else is we are asking them to do something with that piece of information. And often when it's something negative, we're asking them to reduce their energy on our behalf, which if you think about it, isn't super nice. It's also not necessary most of the time. Often all it does is get, give whatever shit we're going through more importance than it deserves. So just keep in mind when you hand someone information, you are asking them to do something with it. So decide whether or not you want to hand certain things to them moving forward. Maybe just don't pass it along at all. Maybe it's just a, you know, what you're doing is redirecting. I'm not saying like, just start lying and saying, I'm great all the time, but just like, just think about it. Like, what do I want them to feel when I communicate? All right. The next tool is called soul rope kind of like a chiropractor. This is for inner and outer alignment. And what I mean is matching your words to your actions. Just if you can make a gentle adjustment to make, to take this seriously, just to take your actions seriously, specifically when it comes to matching your words to your actions, because this makes up a very large part of your self-definition. If you are accountable, it makes you feel trustworthy to yourself. It is huge. It's a huge cornerstone personality trait thing. It tells you your worth in many ways. It shows you how strong you are. It shows you if you can be trusted. So simply by doing what we say we will do with other people and keeping our word, keeping our plans, being showing up, we, ch- we alter so much about our own ability to have self-control and stamina and inner strength. It's like, uh, you wouldn't think that all of those things are connected, but it makes you a trillion times more powerful, confident, balanced, capable. I mean, I feel like that was a huge change that happened in my life. I, that, that simple shift of actually giving a fuck if I was going to do what I said I was going to do made it so that I now believe I can do anything at all in the world. (laughs) believe I am superhuman. (laughs) Not really superhuman. You know what I mean. A kid. Um, Okay. Next tool. And my last tool is called where your energy goes, your life goes. So this is just a, a, a consciousness thing about allowing yourself to rest in energy for too long. The, because the energy you allow yourself to stay in, it can keep you stuck. It'll get you, it'll slow you down. It's key. So wherever you're going to be, if it's not a good place, try and keep it brief. It's really important to keep it moving, keep your thoughts moving. So like if you start to allow yourself to lean into woe or to spread it, you're making an unconscious a choice. Like what we say also tells our partner how to, how the future will follow. So if we can keep it light, keep it moving keep it, you know, positive, they will feel more inclined to do so as well. So by saying something, we are going to make it more real and more true. We know that. Um, but I say this to, to just echo in your mind that there will be, you know, moments when you're starting to tell a negative story. Like for me, it's like, if I don't sleep and I can hear my brain start to say those sentences, that I might utter the next day, like about my hard night and about how tired I am and how I got such bad sleep. But that's your brain starting to choose a hard story, starting to select a woeful one. And that's starting to tell me how I will feel. I can in that moment, in that instance that that script starts to play out, I can redirect it and say, maybe I'll feel great tomorrow. And maybe I I will feel like I did sleep. Maybe it will not be a thing at all. 
And this is like how in the moment when it's easiest to redirect that script and also redirect the course of the feelings that are catalyzed on behalf of those thoughts. So if you find yourself starting to repeat, oh, I'm exhausted, just keep it moving, keep that thought moving and redirect it to the next less woeful, more positive alternative thought. Start thinking something new, preferably something lighter. Think the opposite. So before I close, I wanted to thank my latest sponsors, Jake, a new Patreon sponsor. Thank you so much. And Hope, a new sponsor on Patreon also. And Sia, Saya, thank you, a new monthly sponsor through Yay With Me. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. And anyone who doesn't have the means, I am now... um, offering free chats on yaywithme.com. If you feel comfortable being recorded, I now offer free sessions and they will be recordings that either live on the podcast or live on my Patreon page. So I invite you to check that out. So in closing, life does not have to be complex or burdensome. So just look at the issues that follow certain people in your life. Like there's some people that you can just see are trapped in a way of thinking, almost like they're holding a tiny portable TV set and they're just rewatching an old tragedy, you know, like on loop. It's like, it's like that little TV set. It's coming in the form of a narrative. We speak the narrative. We tell ourselves again and again and again about our lives. Our attachment and judgment of issues is what causes the most suffering, and the things we tell ourselves to feel are the things we will more likely feel. So just by altering our expectation of what we will feel and also removing the negative narration and speculation of what is to come, just that simple act, becoming aware of the moments we are forecasting and how things will go, and instead deliberately asking if maybe they will be totally the opposite and things will go great, This is a monumental shift. It sounds small and simple, but it is massive. So I hope you make a shift, even a tiny one. And I want to say also, um, for those of you who leave comments in, uh, on Apple podcasts or on SoundCloud, I do read them. Thank you so much. They make me so happy. Like literally the happiest anything makes me in the world besides, joy with my family. It's my favorite thing in life. So thank you. And I wanted to end this episode on a personal note. I wanted to dedicate this episode to Leslie Fightmaster. I recently learned of her passing. She was my favorite yoga teacher on YouTube. And for Leslie, just life is so precious and you don't know how much time you have. So tell someone how you feel about them appreciate them, thank them, and know that the relationship I have with you is a real one. It has weight and meaning, and you matter to me even though we haven't met. Leslie Fightmaster helped me so much over the years when all I could do was feel pain. She was my resource, my medicine, my healing, my friend. When I was not strong enough to see friends, to get out of my house, to be around human beings, I watched her uh, today in honor of the person I had a last, my last free chat with, who is a mom and a listener. Um, and you can see her story on Patreon. Her assignment that I gave her was to go roller skating as a gift for herself so she could be herself. So I thought I'm going to do something for myself in solidarity. And that thing was yoga with Leslie, which I did. And I loved it. And then I saw a posting of her memorial service. And it made me really register how much she meant to me and how much of a connection I had to her. So I do these because I know you, because you're like me, and what helps me might help you too. And I, um, I am celebrating the, the morning I'm doing right now for Leslie because there is joy in meaning it. Pain shows us where we love. So my point here is not to bring you down and make you feel sad. (laughs) My point here is that I really loved and cared about Leslie and I had never met her. But that relationship was really powerful in my life, just like the relationship we have together is also powerful. So never take that for granted that I mean what I say and that I'm saying it to you 
because I love and care about you. And as always, smile. Thank you.